where populations are at risk of mass atrocity crimes, encouraging states and the international community to take preventive measures when there are observable risks to take appropriate timely action in response to ongoing atrocities and to ensure accountability for atrocities when they occur. For many of the situations we follow, one of the tools available to the UN is peace operations. These operations are an important tool in the protection of civilians from the physical threat of mass atrocities, as well as in the robust protection of their human rights. Among the many roles that human rights divisions play in peacekeeping missions is a critical monitoring and reporting function. But during the Global Center's advocacy on country situations, we've observed an unfortunate trend. Um, while these human rights divisions have published incredibly rich critical reports documenting human rights violations that may amount to crimes against humanity or war crimes in places like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, South Sudan, Mali, and elsewhere, their reports often don't receive the level of attention and traction they deserve with decision makers, particularly given the gravity of risks they highlight. Unlike investigative mechanisms mandated by the Human Rights Council, they often lack the mandated routine updates during HRC sessions in Geneva. And in New York, their findings often receive only short mentions by the head of mission amidst other mission priorities during Security Council sessions. During this event, we will discuss the rich body of work being produced by these offices, many of which were a dual Department of Peace Operations and Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights hat. Uh, and we'll talk about the ways to amplify their findings with the Security Council and Human Rights Council to ensure their warnings regarding potential atrocity risks are better able to inform decision making on civilian protection. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. I would like to welcome the permanent representative of Canada to the UN, Her Excellency, Her, Her Excellency Ambassador Leslie Norton to take the floor with some opening remarks. Thanks very much, Jacqueline. And it's been a while since I've been on a Zoom call, so I couldn't find the uh, the, the the mute button there. But uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attending today's discussion. And thank you to the, the Global Center for Responsibility to Protect for their efforts in organizing this really important and timely gathering. I'd also like to thank all of our esteemed panelists and speakers in advance for what will no doubt be a really valuable and insightful contribution uh, to today's conversation. And I'm really delighted to be co-hosting this event with Switzerland and the Global Centre. Canada has been at the forefront of supporting and advancing R2P over the past two decades abroad and at home. It's why we appointed a national R2P focal point who facilitates national coordination and promotes international cooperation to strengthen efforts to prevent and respond to atrocity crimes. It's also why we are active members of the group of friends of R2P in both New York and in Geneva. As we know, human rights are universal, indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated. The promotion of human rights is an integral part of Canada's history, policies, and constructive engagement around the world. Canada is strongly committed to engaging constructively on human rights within the rules-based international multilateral system, and our government is committed to doing more at home and abroad, both in peacetime and during armed conflict, including in relation to UN peacekeeping missions. We all know that violent conflicts often lead to human rights violations, which can further the intensity and duration of conflicts and make it more difficult to achieve lasting peace. And lack of accountability for human rights violations further undermines these prospects. Tackling human rights violations is therefore a crucial part to addressing any conflict. And we also know that one of the tools in the R2P toolkit for situations undergoing extreme violence and conflict is of course the establishment of peacekeeping missions. Peacekeepers are increasingly asked to deploy to environments where the risk factors for mass atrocity crimes are present or crimes are currently occurring. No aspect of a UN peacekeeping mission is more important than that of the protection of civilians. The need for conditions that make lasting peace possible the credibility of the UN as an organization and the simple moral imperative make protecting the human rights of those in conflict situations essential, especially those of civilians. UN peacekeeping missions thus have a critical role in working to prevent human rights violations in conflict settings, including through direct intervention to protect civilians, monitoring, investigating human rights violations when they occur and providing advice on how to respond to such violations. 
the full implementation of the human rights due diligence policy by UN peacekeeping operations and the Secretariat also ensures that the support the UN provides to non-UN security forces, including government security forces, is consistent with the UN Charter and in full compliance with international humanitarian, human rights and refugee law. This is an important policy that requires our collective support. Including strong, clear human rights objectives and peacekeeping mandates can more effectively set the foundations for people-centered solutions to conflicts, which is essential for a more stable and enduring transition into peace building and development. Peacekeeping missions can also promote human rights by supporting local governments and meeting their human rights obligations under international law and strengthening the rule of law through institutional reform and capacity building. These missions can also engage with local communities on human rights concerns and assist in supporting and empowering civil society in the pursuit of justice and reconciliation. Because these priorities are not limited to peacekeeping missions, human rights principles, of course, are an essential part of all of the work of the UN. The promotion of human rights should be a driving force towards a whole of system UN approach. So today is really an excellent opportunity to discuss how we can bridge the gap between Geneva and New York between the UN Security Council and the Human Rights Council, and between peacekeeping mandates associated with ensuring peace and security, and the vital work they also provide in the context of human rights assessments. I look forward to this really timely discussion on how human rights work in UN peacekeeping missions connects efforts in both New York and Geneva. And once again, thank you very much for attending today's event. Back to you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Norton, and thank you to Canada for um, your support to the Global Center and to this important initiative. We are delighted to be joined today by a distinguished panel for this event. Um, with us today are Erica Bussey, Deputy Director of the Joint Human Rights Office of MONUSCO, Musa Gassama, Director of the Human Rights Division of UNMIS, and representative of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in South Sudan, Guillaume Negefa, Director of the Human Rights Division of MINUSMA and representative of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Mali, and Oscar Solera, Strategic Planning Team Leader of the Peace Mission Support Section of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in New York. It is a pleasure to have you all with us. The format for today's event will be a series of questions um, from me to our panelists. So I will start uh, the conversation with a question to Erica. In addition to monthly or quarterly alerts documenting the number of violations and abuses by perpetrator and by region, human rights divisions often do deeper analysis of a particular trend in violations, such as um, UNJHRO's recent report on torture in DRC since 2019, um, or investigations into specific incidents of violence and its impact on populations. In this regard, UNJHRO has been very clear in recent years in labeling certain acts as constituting atrocity crimes and in determining alleged responsibility of particular armed groups. Why has it been so important for the mission that the international community understand the actions of these groups through this lens? Uh, thank you very much, Jacqueline. Um, I'd like to, first of all, thank uh, the Global Center for the responsibility to protect uh, for the opportunity to take part in this panel and also to the permanent missions of Canada and Switzerland. Um, and thank you for the question. Um, as you noted, the Joint Human Rights Office uh, produces monthly, uh, we also produce biannual and annual reports, which tend to be quite quantitative. Um, however, we also uh, periodically uh, produce other reports that are either focused on specific thematic areas, on trends, or also on uh, specific incidents. So some examples of thematic reports include the report that, that you mentioned on torture. We also issued last year a report on hate speech uh, and previously also on the fight against impunity. Um, we've also uh, issued reports on specific in, in, uh, incidents of human rights violation. For example, um, uh, a report on the Likofi uh, operation against street children in Kinshasa, um, as well as uh, reports on specific trends, for example, on uh, abuses committed by various armed groups, such as the ADF um, or uh, various armed groups in, in, uh, in North Kivu, um, and also by Kodeko and Ituri. Um, I think that uh, in, in addition to the quantitative reports, this gives us an opportunity to do some in-depth analysis 
Um, for the thematic reports, these often feed into the strategic priorities of the office and of the mandate of the mission. Um, for example, the report on torture um, has some key recommendations that allow us to continue our support to authorities, for example, in the operationalization of the National Preventive Measure on uh, Mechanism on Torture. Um, and also on uh, measure, the, the report on hate speech gave us the opportunity to, to engage with authorities also on measures to uh, prevent and respond to hate speech. Um, the reports that we have issued on specific trends and on specific incidents um, try to identify or understand the root causes of specific conflicts, uh, to look at different armed group dynamics, um, and to serve as, as uh, early warning uh, of specific trends um, which might lead to future violations and abuses. Um, in terms of the, the labeling of certain acts as constituting atrocity crimes, um, these are, of course, human rights reports and not criminal investigations. So we are careful to uh, indicate that these may amount to crimes against humanity. Um, but of course, um, it's important for us uh, for a variety of reasons uh, to be able to attribute responsibility for certain human rights and uh, violations and abuses to uh, certain armed groups, but also to security forces. Um, some of the uh, key reasons for the importance of our public reporting um, lie, first of all, as I mentioned, in, in uh, its function uh, as a mechanism for early warning and for prevention. Um, this, these reports obviously draw attention uh, to the uh, to these incidents um, to the international community to, to allow for actions to be taken at various different levels, either Geneva, New York, um, or also by the international community um, at large. Um, in addition, um, these are important in terms of accountability. Um, while they themselves are human rights reports, we do bring these to the attention of the authorities and they can serve as the basis for investigations into human rights violations and abuses. And we often share more information than that's in the public report with the authorities um, and provide technical and logistical assistance to the authorities in investigating um, and holding trials for these violations. Um, what is also important is that they can serve as a tool um, for advocacy um, in respect for particular emblematic cases. Um, and we've had cases in the past where, um, you know, this has led to various different kinds of pressure being put on the authorities to investigate certain incidents, including by actors uh, such as the, uh, the SRSG on uh, conflict-related sexual violence, um, but also uh, within, within the country. Um, it's also very important in terms of our engagement with uh, embassies, with the international community here in Kinshasa. We hold monthly briefings for the diplomatic community um, and the reports have served um, as the basis uh, in some cases for um, the decisions by, by certain countries to impose sanctions on certain individuals, either uh, leaders of armed groups, but also in certain cases, particularly um, in 2015, 2014, um, uh, also members of the security forces. Um, it's also led to decisions by certain embassies to suspend support uh, to, for example, the police based on uh, the record of human rights violations. Um, and also for embassies to engage in demarche with authorities, um, as was the case recently in, in relation to restrictions on, on journalists in, in DRC. Um, in addition to the public reporting, we also um, engage with the, the group of experts on the DRC and also the sanctions committee. So this provides another opportunity for targeted uh, for targeted action against certain perpetrators. Um, and I also wanted to highlight the importance of these reports and the attributions of responsibility for the listing and delisting of armed groups and also security forces uh, in relation to sexual violence and also um, uh, children in armed conflict. Um, and finally, um, it, these can also serve as the basis for actions um, by the Security Council or the Human Rights Council, um, for example, the reporting that, that the Joint Human Rights Office did in relation to the Kaminya Zapu um, formed the basis for the establishment of the team of international experts on the Kasai. Um, I would also just like to highlight that this also feeds into the analysis uh, for the human rights due diligence policy. Um, which is also another tool um, to, uh, to work with the authorities on accountability and prevention. And I'll just say a few uh, words about some of the key principles that's, uh, that, that are important to the reporting that is done in these areas. Um, the first is it's very important to have transparency with the authorities and to share reports with the authorities for their comments. Um, this can also uh, lead authorities to take to take measures that they might not otherwise take, for example, to pursue accountability mechanisms against certain perpetrators. Um, it's also very important for us to have the, the backing of mission leadership for the reporting that we do. Um, and of course, uh, to also have our independence as uh, OHCHR. So we have a, 
a separate Twitter account. Uh, and if, if, if in particularly sensitive cases, it's possible for reports to be issued as OHCHR alone. Um, I think it's also very important for the reports to be impartial. Um, we report both on abuses by armed groups, but also on uh, violations by the by the security forces. Um, and I think that lends credibility to, to our reporting also with the authorities um, in the country. And finally, um, while we've discussed some of the in-depth reporting that we've done, um, given the faster pace of modern communications, it's also important uh, for us to be able to communicate via Twitter, um, via public statements, either by the mission or by OHCHR, particularly um, in, in light of unfolding events. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. I really appreciate um, how multifaceted the work of the team is and um, how well integrated it is in terms of informing different processes from um, sanctions committees to the embassies um, on the ground and other international actors. Um, since you mentioned the team of experts, I think this is uh, a perfect transition into the question for Musa. Uh, Musa, for each country that the mission on this panel operates in, there are several UN mechanisms responsible for monitoring and reporting on the human rights situation in their respective country. Uh, for South Sudan, this includes the UNMIS Human Rights Division and the Human Rights Council Mandated Commission on Human Rights in South Sudan. Um, since both of these mechanisms fall under the umbrella of OHCHR, what is the unique added value of each of these tools in the protection of human rights in South Sudan, and how do they cooperate and complement one another? Um, thank you for having me as a member of uh, uh, or as a, a panelist in, uh, for today's discussion. Um, yes, these are two UN uh, mechanisms uh, for South Sudan. Um, but just also to explain that um, they are created differently. The Commission for Human Rights on, on Human Rights for South Sudan is created by the Human Rights Council, and therefore it reports only to the Human Rights Council, which is based in Geneva. Um, whereas the other mechanism, that is the Human Rights Division, um, it's within the UNMIS, the peacekeeping uh, mission, uh, which draws um, its mandate from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and also from the UN Security Council resolution establishing um, UNMIS, uh, the peacekeeping uh, mission. So we report both to OSHR as well as um, to New York through the mission leadership. Um, in terms of focus of these two mechanisms, Yes, both, of, both mechanisms do monitor and report on the human rights situation in South Sudan. But um, there is some differences in terms of focus. Uh, for example, the commission um, goes beyond just addressing the conflict-related human rights um, issues, but also looking at um, other difficult issues which are having an impact on the enjoyment of human rights in South Sudan. Uh, they recently published a report on, uh, on economic crimes. Um, which um, as a human rights division would hardly go uh, would venture into. So this is something very unique uh, that the commission uh, was able to, to produce. Um, we do quite a lot of um, work together, uh, for example, on conflict related sexual violence. They've also just recently issued a report on um, conflict related sexual violence, and um, the human rights division has also been tracking uh, the, the, the cases of um, situation of conflict and violence um, throughout the years. So we have similarities, but also there are, um, each one has its own um, uniqueness, uniqueness, uniqueness. And again, if you look at um, our mandate, we do quite a lot of also focus on the protection of civilians within the mission. So most of our data is um, about tracking the civilian casualties and also as data uh, for the mission as, and the, as contribution, contribution to the early warning of, of the mission itself. Um, also, if you look at um, the two mandates, um, they are a little bit more limited and focused on the transnational justice um, area, um, quite a lot of um, advocacy on the implementation of chapter five, um, looking at the hybrid court especially, and also the establishment of the truth commission. Um, the human rights division do also contribute to that work. And um, just to give an example where we definitely work together in a collaborative way, um, leveraging our comparative advantages 
is the uh, workshop in Nairobi in December 2021, um, which was organized by the commission with our support. Um, also, we were able to work together, um, testing our convening power um, to bring quite a lot of actors to Nairobi to talk about um, the momentum for transnational justice. Um, we were able to bring the, about, uh, the Minister of Justice and about three other ministers, civil society uh, representatives, as well as um, key organs of the African Union. Um, this is the first uh, time we were able to come together and to review and take stock of what is happening on the implementation of Chapter 5. And I think that was also very, very important, um, showing how we work together and also how we leverage our comparative um, advantages to achieve a common goal. Uh, most of our reports, as I said, um, are very complementary. They reinforce our advocacy and also our messaging. Um, in terms of data collection also, because we have a greater number of um, staff across the country, uh, whereas the commission has a limited number of staff, we try to work together to make sure that um, we share data, uh, we share information, and we support the investigation missions of the commission because we have a bigger uh, logistics than them. And uh, we try to make sure that um, the mission also lend a hand uh, when they are deployed to do any fact-finding uh, mission across uh, the country. So there is quite a lot of collaboration and quite a lot of support uh, to each other. And also, um, again, um, in terms of uh, the technical guidance um, that we do provide to the government in you know, Chapter 5, the Chapter 5 of the Peace Agreement, um, the Commission comes with a lot of briefs, conference briefs, um, that um, provide some very, very practical recommendations on the way forward on transnational justice in South Sudan. And for us as a human rights division, um, I don't think we have that level of expertise. And therefore we definitely rely on the, um, those guidance, on those guidelines um, in terms of our guide advocacy, but also in terms of our advisory support to the mechanisms for the implementation of um, chapter five. Um, so for us as a human rights division, Again, in terms of reporting, both Geneva and New York consume our, our, our reports. And I think this is one way of bridging the gap between um, Geneva, New York, and the field. Um, I think I would stop here for a course of time. Over to you. Thank you so much, Musa. I, I really appreciate that framing of leveraging your comparative ad, uh, advantages because um, you know, you've shown really well how you each have um, unique responsibilities and um, unique skill sets that you can leverage. And I think, you know, often when we're advocating for the creation of mechanisms at the HRC, there is that question of, you know, there's already a mechanism in the mission. Why do we need another human rights mechanism? And you've shown very clearly why there's a value in having um, two um, mechanisms with distinct mandates that can help support each other quite well within a country. My next question is for Guillaume. Um, each of you work in dangerous operating environments where the government sometimes limits access to areas of concern and where government and allied forces are themselves perpetrators. Um, since the beginning of 2022, MINUSMA has faced particular challenges accessing sites of alleged crimes due to insecurity and restrictions placed on the mission by the transitional authorities. Um, consequently, investigations and regular human rights reporting has been hampered. What, if any, ramifications have you seen for populations as a result of the underreporting of human rights violations and abuses due to these restrictions? Oh, I think you're still muted. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for inviting me to be one of the uh, the panelists of this uh, this uh, event uh, to share one of the uh, the experiences and the restrictions and the obstacles that we are we are facing as a human rights uh, component. Um, there is no denying the fact that uh, the access restrictions have been reshaped the way we conduct our monitoring and investigation work. Um, I may say that uh, that's not uh, this is not due to the attitude of the government of Mali, 
but uh, during the COVID, we have already restrictions, uh, and then we did our way capacity on doing remote investigations. Um, uh, first of all, uh, during the COVID, uh, the human rights component of the uh, of this mission uh, was, uh, you know, the staff, the staff, and these five. Uh, of staff remain because we think that uh, uh, human rights situation was uh, worsening. So there was a need for us to conduct and to continue our work. Um, during the COVID, we conducted using all uh, precautions, health precautions, we conducted more than five um, field uh, missions to investigate human rights violations. Uh, and then that, that's how we, uh, we updated completely our, our work. So the, the new restrictions, the attitude of the government to restrict our work is not surprising for us because we have already working on a restricted uh, area by the security because we, 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 we cannot be deployed where uh, the, uh, you know, the security situation is at stake. We cannot be deployed. We are not accompanied by our force. So we developed new way of working. That's important to say. Um, number one, we strengthen our capacity of a network. Community web network were, were strengthened. We have, uh, you know, a call centers. We have uh, almost five call centers where people that can report directly to the human rights violations. And then also we have been given the, uh, the, the, the situation, we have been relocating sources, you know, those who can provide us with uh, information. And then of, of course today we are using also new technologies, uh, drone, satellite uh, imageries and, and uh, et cetera. So um, when the government defied uh, the international community during the debate, the Secret Council debate in Mali saying that they would not allow uh, MINUSMA uh, to conduct uh, his uh, human rights uh, mandate, for us, we have, we have already well prepared. Um, the second uh, one for, 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 for us uh, to say that uh, this situation has to be read in line with the new context, because uh, in Mali since uh, December uh, 2011, we have a new partner, what we call uh, foreign private, uh, foreign uh, uh, private military personnel associated with Wagner. So the arrival of Wagner has changed completely uh, the, uh, the way the mission has been working because the government is in the mood of uh, uh, to deny, first of all, to deny all human rights uh, instances of human rights violations, and secondly, um, they are saying that uh, Wagner is not present in Mali. So what they have in Mali is instructed, you know, uh, so instructed. is against this background that, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, restrictions have been imposed uh, to the, the mission, but the, the, uh, the restrictions really apply everywhere. The restrictions are applied only where there is serious human rights allegations uh, imputed to the Malian Defense and Security Forces or to a Wagner element, what they call uh, military uh, uh, personnel. So the government is justified. We have been some justifications on this. One is that they cannot, uh, you know, ensure the security, the human rights uh, officers in those those areas. Secondly, um, the government has imposed no-fly zones. That's important for us. No-fly zones. So it means that. Uh, those areas that we want to go and then conduct investigation are uh, under military operations. And then for this, you know, we don't have uh, any other excuse that uh, to comply um, with the, uh, the, the government, you know, the, the government the, the, the decisions. Um, despite this context of restrictions, of uh, imposition of uh, uh, fly zones, uh, you know, and then also coupled with, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, disinformation campaign, because this, this is uh, accompanied by disinformation campaign against MINUSMA, against human rights component, has been seen as the uh, backing the, uh, the French foreign policy and then to try to overthrow the government here. So this has to be seen as, uh, as, as, as that. Despite this, the human rights uh, division uh, published 
several uh, quarterly notes. Um, we, uh, we systematically contribute to the uh, Secretary General report to the Security Council. Uh, we have a strengthened our methodology because the government is uh, trying to defy, uh, to read word by word of our reports in order to challenge it. So we, uh, uh, with the support of colleagues in New York and Geneva, we reinforce our way of, uh, 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 you know, uh, writing report methodology. So um, I guess why finally the government has. Uh, as a proposed to the Security Council, to saying that he was complaining about the multiplication of uh, human rights reports, citing, for example, mission uh, quarterly note, uh, specific thematic human rights report, the report of an independent expert, committees, and so on and so on. And then, so they are strongly recommended that we should have one consolidated uh, 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 report, which is totally. Uh, uh, different because of the uh, you know the, the objective and then also the, uh, the purpose of uh, each, uh, each each report. So in conclusion, uh, I will I will say that uh, you know uh, uh, did not really uh, 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 have a negative impact on our capacity to monitor, document, investigate, and then a report. Since the beginning of the, this year, we, 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 we completed 24 special investigations in addition to other investigation, which is not really uh, small, you know, small instances of, 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 of violations. Lastly, I have put in place, you know, a critical dialogue with the, with the uh, um, Malian Defense and Security Forces to open a window of a dialogue, which is the training. We have been training the Malian, uh, Malian Defense and Security Forces, and then opening you know, a window of opportunity on the, on the dialogue. is against this background that I have been conducting uh, very recently uh, four field missions you know, to, to discuss our report, our findings with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the theater commanders of the regional office to at least to take stock of their own sentiments on the way that we are doing. And finally, I think we uh, we have a we have a, a, a network of the uh, of uh, NGOs, and then the NGOs, uh, you know, always to report uh, uh, um, division, and that that's how we continue to provide credible information uh, on human rights. So I will stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, Guillaume. Um, you know, I really appreciated how you highlighted um, that there was a bit of a, a pivot and rethinking um, strategies, but also, you know, you really highlighted well the challenges that missions face when it comes to um, host countries and host countries' perspectives on human rights reporting and, um, documentation and the challenges that you face there and and sort of touched a little on you know what we discussed with Musa about the different types of human rights investigations so thank you for that um, Oscar since you're uh, coming to us from New York um, a slightly different question for you um, as bodies that are sensitive to human rights protection and operate in what is traditionally be considered peace and security spaces, uh, the human rights divisions of peace operations and your office in New York both occupy a unique position in terms of creating linkages between New York, Geneva, and countries where populations are at risk. Nevertheless, much of the reporting by these components is publicly released via OHCHR um, without that sort of formal requirement to brief states in New York or Geneva. Um, since the commission of atrocity crimes represents a human rights threat and a threat to international peace and security, what more can be done to ensure that their findings are better amplified with relevant decision-making bodies, including the Security Council and Human Rights Council? Thanks very much, uh, Jacqueline, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, to, to all. Um, let, first, let me first uh, start by thanking um, the Global Center, uh, the governments of Canada and Switzerland for organizing this event and inviting me. Uh, and uh, um, also to stress that I look forward to actually being able to engage a bit more 
um, with with all of you, with the global South, but, but also um, with with Canada and Switzerland here in New York. Um, and also allow me, please, to to um, take this opportunity to pay tribute to my colleagues, to Guillaume, to Musa, to Erica, and their teams, because as as you have heard, they are doing extremely wonderful work in the field in extremely sensitive, difficult situations. So, you know, a big chapeau to, to them. Um, there, there's three aspects that I would like to, to uh, uh, highlight in relation to your question. One is, um, yes, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner uh, in New York plays uh, a, a very important role in linking the human rights questions to the more political uh, agenda of the peace and security uh, bodies in, in New York. Um, you, you may know that this was not easy always. Uh, there was a lot of resistance and that there is still some resistance uh, to have a, a human rights office um, so active in New York. However, uh, if you see uh, how the Office of the High Commissioner has grown over the last 10 years in New York, we have uh, moved from some five staff in, in 2008 to over 60 in, uh, in 2022, which highlights uh, the importance that human rights has gained, not just in the peace and security agenda, but also in relation to, to the other bodies in, in New York. Um, it is also true that our office plays a, a central role in, in linking uh, the political discussions that take place in New York uh, with what happens in the field. Um, traditionally, uh, most of the information used to go uh, to the um, central human rights body, uh, which is Human Rights Council in, in Geneva. However, the presence of OHHR uh, in New York has allowed for an increased representation of human rights questions in the Security Council in particular, uh, but also in, in the uh, other committees of, of the General Assembly, for instance, in the C-34, um, but also in the fifth committee in relation to funding, which is also fundamental for the work that the colleagues in the field do uh, as their operations are financed uh, through the budget of, of the organization. So uh, we have developed uh, over the last couple of years what we like to call, um, uh, jokingly, a love triangle which is, of course, uh, one vertex is New York, the other vertex is Geneva, and third is, 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 uh, is the field. And um, we do indeed engage very regularly with all the colleagues on the screen, uh, with Guillaume, uh, with Erica, with, with Musa, uh, as part of this work that we do. Um, I, I usually insist with my colleagues here that uh, while we do human rights work, we are actually bringing the political agenda closer to human rights and human rights closer to the political agenda. Uh, and, and that is because we recognize that human rights is, is not just a topic where member states will just tick a box and say we have complied, but rather that human rights are part of all political negotiations that are part of all um, the, the political aspects that are negotiated in, different, in the different countries. Which leads me to the second part of the question, which is about uh, the report. Um, I'd like to nuance the perception that because human rights reports um, are not formally presented to the Security Council or to the Human Rights Council per se, constitutes a, a disadvantage. I, I think that there is a lot that happens with these with these reports. For instance, um, when any of the three colleagues uh, in their missions release a human rights report. Uh, yes, it is indeed released publicly by OHEHR and the mission, or by the mission itself, or by OHEHR. So there is a public release, so there is a huge outreach that is that is done. Um, these reports do re reach the Security Council because we are here and we have an active engagement with Security Council members. We transmit their reports uh, to Security Council. So they have uh, and when there is a discussion on any of the missions that have a human rights mandate, uh, we engage with member states who have read the reports and who are actually demanding. So they are, they are expecting that we provide information uh, so that they can feed into their interventions 
uh, in the Security Council. Let's not forget that in the Security Council, we have both the public part, which is where they will make their, their public statements, but there's also the second element, which is the closed consultations, where much of the human rights information is actually used to um, resolve and address many of the challenges that all of these countries are going through. Um, we take advantage of the fact that these reports reach the Security Council to also bring uh, the heads of the components to New York, uh, either in person or virtually. So Guillaume or Musa or Erika um, um, are able uh, to, to brief Security Council members um, at the expert level. So we organize informal or we assist member states in organizing informal expert level briefings where, you know, in this informal setting, there is an exchange about the different elements that they have identified in their reports, be it on protection of civilians, but also in the implementation of their human rights uh, mandates. So th there is an exchange and, and there is a flow, a continuous flows of information. And, and that amongst the 15 members in the Security Council. So uh, th there is maybe a perception that there are some members that are not interested in fact, the 15 members are on the demanding side. So all of them have different interests in relation to, to human rights, maybe not the same, but, but uh, they are there and they are all concerned um, about the situation. Uh, just recently, uh, as you may know, there was the discussion on Haiti. And let's say, I don't want to name states, but you know, less traditional states took the floor to express concern about the human rights situation in Haiti. So that's remarkable. And I think that that's part of the fact that they had recent information uh, that was that was uh, used there. It is true, however, that there are very rarely formal briefings by the High Commissioner or by uh, our Assistant Secretary General uh, for Human Rights in New York to the Security Council. They are rarely invited to provide briefings. Um, and it's something that, you know, it's it's important that we need to continue working on. And we need to engage um, at the informal level with uh, the 15 members. Um, and, and now that you know Switzerland is part of the organizers of the events, you know, just just say it's important that they will be joining the Security Council. It's important that the High Commissioner or the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights are invited to brief the Council. It could be publicly, it could be in close in close consultations, uh, but it's important they do have a voice. Um, but in the end, what they will be bringing is the information that the colleagues in the field have, have produced. Um, now, there is more that can be done. Yes, indeed. Um, it is easier to transmit this information to Geneva because the Human Rights Council is the open um, house for this information to be, to be shared. And I think the high commissioners have always used the reports produced by the colleagues to underscore the challenges uh, that take place in, in, their, in their respective countries. Um, so I'd say, I'd say that in, Gene in the Geneva front, there is a more um, accept accepting environment for them. New York remains a challenge. Uh, and I do think that not just member states, not just the UN entities, but also NGOs um, like the Global Center could have an impact in um, leading states towards being more accepting to discuss publicly uh, in the Security Council about human rights challenges, particularly because, as you pointed out, Jacqueline, uh, we are talking about atrocity crimes. So these are not minor human rights violations. These, these are important violations that are happening in all of the contexts in, in, in Mali, in uh, the DRC, in South Sudan. So it is worth... Um, that the different NGOs that have a voice in New York also continue to invite member states to open up a little bit more and in their country briefings, um, also hear from the perspective of human rights components in the field. Thank you so much, Oscar. And you know, thank you for, for highlighting how sort of the evolution of your office, because I can remember, um, you know, 10 years ago <laughs> when the uh, Office of the High Commissioner's footprint in New York was much smaller. Um, 
So I really appreciate that you've highlighted that as well as the gravity of the crimes we're talking about now. And, you know, we definitely look forward to continuing to engage with, with you and your office on, on how to um, bring this forward more in those sort of informal ways with member states. Um, we just have a few minutes left, but I wanted to ask uh, a question to Erica, Musa, and Guillaume, um, which is unfortunately a big question for such a small amount of time. But um, just to open to the three of you, in what ways does the reporting by um, your office inform and contribute to decisions by mission leadership regarding the protection of civilians, uh, particularly where violations indicate an atrocity risk. I know Erica already mentioned um, that there is a sort of early warning function, but just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about um, how the reporting may influence decision-making. I think we'll go to um, Musa and then Guillaume and Erica. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I think for me, the quick answer is data. Um, in the peacekeeping, the human rights division is one of the um, components that um, gather quite a lot of data um, that is relevant for the effective functioning of, of, of the mission. Um, so for us, is um, the production of, of data um, that can help the mission to take decisions. Um, quite a lot of data comes um, from right across the country. And um, it's not only data, but it's timely and verified data. And I think this is very helpful to the mission in, 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 in any decision-making process. And um, this is really, for me, the big contribution of the Human Rights Division um, uh, to the mission in terms of protection of civilians. It, is, um, it fits into the broader early warning um, system of the mission for early uh, response or for early intervention. And um, as I said, our data is really advocacy for advocacy. So it's a data-driven advocacy. And um, I think it has a voice. Um, um, in the mission. So that is really our contribution. And I can give examples where our data has contributed in, uh, in, in, in influencing decision making in the mission. For example, for the establishment of temporary operational bases by our forces. And also our data fit into all the joint um, uh, operational center and also to our um, analyst um, units in the mission. So we contribute quite a lot from a data perspective. Over to you. Thank you, Ms. Kiam. Yeah. Um, yes, okay, that's a good question. Um, in addition to what uh, Musa said, um, we may say that um, uh, reporting or reports uh, always open avenue of dialogue, internal dialogue and external dialogue. Internal dialogue uh, with the leadership of the mission um, not only the SRG, but also the force, those who could uh, provide support to any uh, deployment of uh, human rights officers for, for the conduct of investigation. So um, we have been quite active because you are monitoring, um, analyzing uh, uh, the situation, and then instances where there are serious allegations of human rights, we, uh, we have an established protocol of uh, deploying uh, human rights officers for investigation with the support of uh, of the force and then uh, uh, and then uh, and then UN Paul. So there is established protocol on, on, on that. So uh, it's it's a machine that's you know uh, working. The second one is that we also open dialogue with the uh, the US government because uh, the primary responsibility of protection of civilian falls under. The human uh, and the the host authority. So what we do, I always do. I encourage the SRG when it's uh, the case is serious to, to to engage directly with the prime minister, and then I will give a call to the um, the minister of justice or the, uh, the the army chief of staff to say that this is happening, and then uh, we wait, we may uh, you know uh, uh, deploy people. The third one is terms of protection is that we have a funding. We have a small funding. For, for protection of, uh, of victims, uh, mostly of victims. So uh, this is also really helpful because uh, it's really elevating the, you know, the, uh, the suffering of, uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, victims as well. So in conclusion, I will say that you know, uh, investigation and then reporting is just one middle. 
and then uh, for us, it's important that uh, we uh, we won, we won, uh, we, we give the warning to the to the mission to take actions, immediate actions, and at the same time, there are follow up actions in terms of uh, advocating that uh, investigation should be uh, open into those, those cases. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Guillaume and Erica. Uh, thank you. Um, I would I would echo uh, what Musa and Guillaume have said. Um, perhaps if I can also just add, I mean, I think uh, within uh, MONUSCO, obviously the reporting also leads to the mission leadership taking certain types of de decisions in terms of where to deploy the force. Um, we had cases in Ituri where there are attacks on IDP camps. Um, and again, the data and the reporting from our office was able to um, inform the mission's decision to deploy to the force to protect civilians in those areas. Um, as Guillaume also mentioned, um, you know, we have the capacity to provide uh, protection for, you know, human rights defenders, for journalists. In the recent M23, uh, on the ongoing M23 situation, um, information that we were able to provide also led to efforts by the mission to evacuate journalists and human rights defenders who are under risk in Ruturo. Um, and of course, as, as Guillaume said, this serves as a basis for advocacy with the authorities. Um, there's a, a currently a situation um, that's quite serious in terms of intercommunity uh, violence in the west of the country. Um, and the reporting and the, 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 the data from our office um, allowed the mission to be able to bring this to the attention of national authorities, um, also to advocate for them in certain situations for the deployment of resources, either you know, the police or the, or the armed forces, depending on the situation. And, and finally, I think, um, as I mentioned, um, obviously for, for accountability, um, human rights officers are also beyond the reporting embedded in many of the early warning and protection mechanisms within the mission and can also use that as a way to um, provide early warning. Um, and finally, I think also um, it's important to look beyond the mission um, and also as, as part of the human humanitarian country team and also the UNCT in, uh, in DRC, uh, often uh, information from our office has also been used to inform responses, uh, for example, humanitarian responses. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. And thank you, um, all three of you, for really showing how, uh, I think as Musa put it, data-driven advocacy um, can really lead to important and critical responses and um, how well integrated that is within all of the mission's work. Um, our final question is for Oscar, uh, a bit of a similar question, but from the New York side, uh, as someone with oversight over all peace operations for the human rights mandate, what best practices have you witnessed in terms of how UN headquarters in New York responds to gross human rights violations and abuses or atrocities reported by these missions? And what ways can their observations be used to mobilize the UN system? Um, so I'll try to be brief because I know we're running out of time. Two observations. Um, I, I think there is still a gap that needs to be bridged between the Human Rights Council in Geneva and the Security Council in New York in terms of streamlining better um, the, the different human rights mandates that I provide. For instance, we have a uh, mission uh, in uh, Mali and in, in South Sudan and in DRC and many others with a, hu a strong human rights man, strong human rights team. We have special rapporteurs with country mandates in, in Geneva, uh, which received the mandate from another body with different, with different expectations. Um, sometimes it is, and I know for the colleagues and, and I don't want to speak for them, but I have, I have witnessed the difficulties that there can be when you have these two mandates um, that need to work together in a coherent way, uh, but they have received their the ticket from a different body and the expectations are different. So there is a need to better communicate. I mean, this is member states. So the same ones that sit in Geneva sit in New York. So there needs to be a better coherence between member states when they think about these mandates, um, when, particularly when we're dealing with uh, countries that have a peace operation with a, with a strong human rights mandate. Uh, that happens in, in South Sudan where we have the commission, for instance, uh, and, and we need to ensure just for the coherence of the system that the two, the mission uh, and Musa's team and the commission are able to work together uh, at, at Unison providing uh, similar messaging, but also dividing labor because of course, being able to speak in Geneva is not the same as being, speak, being able to speak in New York. They have different messages that they can provide. So they need to articulate better 
states need to also think about the consequences when they create mandates, uh, that they need to work together, provide the resources, uh, but also the, let's say, the, uh, the, the field, the guidelines for them to articulate better. Um, I also think that in, in relation to um, responding, responding to atrocities uh, and in relation to the question of early warning, I do think that, I mean, if you see how these teams in the field operate, they are there on a daily basis. They produce early warning reports. They are out in the field. They are late alerting the authority. They are alerting uh, the UN system through their reports. Um, so I think the UN system, the UN uh, um, secretary, if I can put it like this, has created the necessary tools. But what we need also is that member states react to those information. Uh, and I do think, and, and you know, we were discussing before about better articulation between you know atrocity crimes uh, in in New York and the information that these teams produce. I'm thinking, for instance, that when we receive reports from the colleagues in the field, that you know you have a big group of the friends of R2P. So, you know, these reports could also be shared with the friends of R2P, expecting that they would do something with these reports. So the UN secretary cannot function with their main partners, which is member states. Uh, and that to me is the key issue here. We need to bring the UN closer, but these two components, the secretariat and member states, um, so that we can better articulate responses in the field. And we provide the tools to the colleagues in the field to act uh, as, as appropriate on a timely, in a timely manner. Thank you so much for that, Oscar. Um, I agree completely. You know, we often talk in the RTP space about how it's not a lack of early warning, it's a, a lack of early action. And I think your your point about necessary tools and we have the information, we just need a better reaction is, is definitely closely linked to that. Um, I wanna thank our panelists for their uh, time and their important contributions to this discussion today. Uh, I'm sure we could continue having this conversation for much longer, but we're running out of time. I hope that the audience found the discussion as insightful as I did and that the conversation has inspired us all to consider how uh, better to use the findings of these human rights components. Um, so before I close, I would like to give the floor to our second co-host, the permanent mission of Switzerland. Um, Jonas Pasqui will give a short remark on behalf of Switzerland. Thank you so much, uh, Jasleen, and thank you to, to all the, the panelists. Thank you also to the to Canada for, for being our co-host uh, today. Uh, I'm speaking uh, from, 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 from Geneva, but I was serving uh, as head of the Security Council team in, the, in our New York mission previously. So uh, the topic is, is uh, also uh, not only close to Switzerland's priorities, but also close to my, to my heart. And just a few a few words of, of reaction uh, to to the excellent uh, excellent presentations, uh, which highlighted the key importance of, of human rights principles and, and related mandates uh, uh, for, for peacekeeping missions. But we saw we saw we've seen also uh, for others uh, other mechanism. Uh, maybe two 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 main uh, points and 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 as, as as a way forward first, and also to react a little bit to what what Oscar has just said regarding um, tools that may not be streamlined or that may not be, that may be in a way complementary, com in, uh, working com complementarily as we saw uh, in, in South Sudan, but also with, with the streamlining. There, I, I wouldn't as a, from the perspective of member states uh, who has been serving on repeated occasion at, this, at the Human Rights Council and will be serving uh, on the, count, the Security Council in, in, a couple, in a few weeks from now, I wouldn't put too much hope uh, with regards to the perfect uh, streamlining of mandates. I mean, first, um, objecting to the fact that the membership is the same, or at least that is it is, it is aligned in a, in a point in time uh, when when dealing with a with a particular crisis with a strong human rights or atrocity uh, uh, dimension. Uh, and second, of course. Uh, we know how things move forward in, in negotiations and that that every every uh, negotiations every mandate is, is, is somehow sui generis so 
So I would I would put much more <laughs> hope in a way in the how to better use it. That's the point that, that Oscar also made. Better make in a in a way of make better use of the data out there and of the excellent uh, analysis and excellent reporting being made by OHCHR and and, and other reporting. Uh, uh, partners or or or, or, the, or really sources uh, very verified sources on the ground as it has been said and based on that i think uh, member states have a responsibility either be them as as security council members as human, as human rights uh, council member but also as as un member states and and i think a strengthened coherence between not only between what they do and and say and hear in Geneva and what they what they do say and hear in New York, but also uh, in in New York th themselves. I mean, if if they are engaging for robust uh, human rights uh, with mandates, uh, then of course they need to fund to fund those mandates in in fifth committee. If uh, they are claiming loud and clear that the human rights monitoring is important, then of course the funding of OHHR as, uh, to begin with is a is a is a is a problem uh, that not on not all member states uh, address with the same level of of urgency. So I th I think they're really strengthening the coherence from 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 within. In a way, it's something that that we are dedicated to do as a, as incoming Security Council member. Um, maybe one one last point that is also very very important. I think, and that would be also a, a question I would have for for colleagues on the ground is the role of of, of civil society. We've seen it's a little bit one of the of, of the of the prides of of the of the UN in Geneva is the the relatively speaking uh, great inclusivity to to civil society, including in the at the at the security at the Human Rights Council, um, and and this is something we are also committed to 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 do our utmost to promote uh, as as a Security Council member. Uh, in a, along the line of what we've been doing also as as observer of, of the last years and there i was i wanted to also uh, maybe uh, uh, have this question back to 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 the panelists with regards to uh what what are what what's what can be done also from from the mission side or or uh, in, in in the existing mandates or uh, what would be needed from the security council or from from member states uh, in order to really uh, be more more forthcoming and really re recognize even more the role of civil uh, society, including in human rights uh, uh, monitoring on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Um, we're out of time, but I just want to see if anyone wants to take a, a brief opportunity to answer his question or if we should just close for today, given the time. Um, Jacqueline, if I can just say, um, th thanks very much to, to Jonas. I mean, this is, uh, as Jacqueline said, uh, a discussion that will continue. Um, and, and just happy to, to say that uh, in, in that respect, uh, we are due to meet with Switzerland indeed next week uh, in New York. To discuss about many of these things and uh, um, so you know this is an ongoing conversation and we are really looking forward to having Switzerland back in the Security Council because we, we count on, on your support for many of these, uh, these uh, issues. Thank you Oscar and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, it was a really fruitful conversation and hopefully uh, the beginning of a longer conversation on these issues.